the theme of this year's SCU meeting is bridging the gap, right? And so that's bridging the gap, I think, between government and the UAP community. But what I'm seeing is a lot of coalition building. So it's really about bridging the gap between a lot of different groups and organizations. They're starting to work together, right? Yeah, that's what I see too. It's very exciting, actually. We've got the scientific groups are all talking to each other. There are advocate, several advocacy, advocacy groups um, working together as well, and that's and and of course now, the scientific groups that are trying to study UAPs are now in touch with some of the people from the advocacy groups. So it'll be interesting to see how this plays out. So you're you've been doing science. That's that's your and I mean again like we've done interviews where you've talked about Hans Oberth and you know and I, I would love to revisit all of those ideas, but. Um, in terms of this science now, you're talking about giving some of this to these advocacy groups so that they can work with the government on that, right? And so hopefully get the word out and again, build momentum. Yeah, well with, well, with the science, I mean, we publish all of our results into the, you know, into peer reviewed journals, that's, that's the idea. And we're, you know, our plan is to make our data public. So, so we're not exactly giving it to advocacy, advocacy groups that are, they're able to get it any time, but, but making those connections makes it a lot easier for us to communicate. And, yeah, yeah. Well, so do you have any updates on the science? I mean, again, we, I think we did an interview two or three months ago, and um, you know, one of the big factors there is you've looked at the speed of UAP, and I, I think the conclusion, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I think your conclusion has been largely the extraterrestrial hypothesis, right? Yeah, well, the speeds and accelerations, especially, are um, are consistent with spacecraft speeds, and and the well, especially the speeds are consistent with spacecraft speeds. The accelerations aren't consistent with anything; they are way beyond anything we're capable of. But it, if um, those accelerations could be maintained in space for short periods of time, you could get up to large percentages of the speed of light. So for example, at a, at a thousand G acceleration, um, it only takes 17 hours to get up to 90% the speed of light. Mm, okay. so, so when we see an object going, when we have radar data and we see that the object accelerated 5,000 Gs, um, it's hard not to imagine that this, you know, th this is certainly possibly a, you know, is a, an interstellar capable craft, at least propulsion wise. Well, and, and that, I think that's a big concept. And again, you, you've also done a lot of work on the Drake equation, right? And so there, there are some potentials there, but um, so not only are these potentially spacecraft, but this could be interstellar, right? This could be something, even without a warp drive, this could be capable of interstellar transits. It would take a while, but it could happen. Yeah, yeah, that's what we see. That's what we see from the data so far, which is exciting. Yeah, well, now one of the other aspects of this, though, is um, potentially these. If I mean, I think that I think that the consensus seems to be that these are technological vehicles, right? So, um, if they're extraterrestrial in origin, potentially they arrived a long time ago, also. Yeah, so, so some of these seem to be technological vehicles. Some, some of them are still rather strange, um, and we don't understand what they all are. Um, but the situation's not quite clear because it appears that these, um, the reaction times of, of UAP to events um, such as the, um, the Fukushima nuclear power plant Mm, um, okay. Disaster where you now have radiation released into the environment. Um, UFOs were there the next day um, in the area, and so it only took 24 hours for them to get there. So they're not all clearly they're not all coming in from interstellar space. Um, they 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 live here in some sense, you know, either in our solar system or on the planet. Well, and the radiation aspect, I didn't, I wasn't aware of Fukushima, but, you know, like uh, Larry Hancock has documented this, and, um, you know, there was UFOs and nukes, and so there have been a lot of different books, and like Lou Elizondo talked about um, this correlation. It's incredibly interesting, and it doesn't look like it's been that well explored yet, but every aspect of the nuclear supply chain, transportation, storage, medical facilities that use nuclear materials, it's amazing 
the UFO correlation between those. Do you ha do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, it's it's certainly interesting. I I first became aware of that through um, Robert Hastings' work. Yeah, and, that was. And um, and the recent um, SCU study that shows the correlation between UFO sightings and nuclear facilities even back to when they were being constructed, when the facilities were being constructed, before there was nuclear material there, you still had a high prevalence of um, UFO sightings, which is really interesting. Um, so th it, it points to some kind of surveillance or monitoring. Um, it's clearly intelligent and, and so. Yeah, no, no, one of the areas that I've always struggled with, though, is a lot of people have interpreted that as UAP sending us a message of some kind or another. But from what I've read, it appears to be maybe more of just, you mentioned surveillance, or maybe just curiosity of some kind, right? Uh, I mean, I've, I've never really seen a, a clear message, although other people have said, look, you know, a, a UFO supposedly shot down like an Atlas missile at some point, so, you know, maybe. I, I don't know. Yeah, that, yeah, the shooting down of um, at least one missile and is the only sign I've seen of any kind of message. Um, well, that that and shutting down the nuclear weapons um, that that also happens. So, um, and then you have the case in Russia where they were actually set to to launch, yeah. and the Russians had to scramble to shut them down. Um, so th those might also be perceived as messages, but um, but I think what you can be certain of is the monitoring surveillance that's clearly going on. Well, and if so, if they if they live here, right? I mean, then maybe maybe that message is you know, hey, we live here too. Don't destroy the planet. I mean, it could be as simple as that. <laughs> yeah, that could very well be the, the case. Um, yeah, we might find that we share this planet with somebody else who we're just not familiar with yet, and they may be very concerned about what we're doing. Yeah. Well, what are your thoughts on this this merging idea? I mean, um, this connection with the ocean as well, and that's something where, uh, with interviews I've been doing recently, I'm hearing more and more people talk about like seawater extraction of materials. And you know that there are some advantages to living in the ocean. One of them is just avoiding people, right? But yeah, oceans are great places to hide, <laughs> and we don't have access. So um, we've barely mapped out our oceans or explored our oceans. So um, avoiding people is certainly high on the list of possibilities. Uh, there's many other reasons for living in oceans. You, you mentioned yeah. extracting materials from seawater. In seawater, you have all sorts of minerals dissolved, and if you want to build things, one way to do it is to pull in seawater and extract the elements that you want to use and, you, and then um, use them to make things um, much, m potentially easier than mining. Yeah. And, um, but, but not as easy because there's not as much mineral in the seawater, so you got to pull in a lot of seawater over a good bit of time to get large quantities of certain minerals. So there's some advantages and disadvantages to that. Well, one of the things that I really liked about that is this, again, this intersectionality, which goes back to bridging the gap between disciplines, right? And so, like, there seems to have been like this siloing of concepts and topics, and UAP in the past has been siloed. But again, your work takes it into the Drake equation and the realm of SETI and things like that. Um, you know, exoplanets, I think, open up a lot of new territory that could apply to UAP. Um, the, the seawater extraction, which someone else had mentioned, again, I'm starting to see reference to that. That's nanotech, right? And so you're getting into advanced materials. And so the UAP topic, it seems, is starting to connect with other topics in science and technology. Yeah, to, that's certainly true. And so since this is an unknown, these things are still very much unknown. It's not clear what fields of science are going to be important, you know, to understanding them. So we'll very possibly have to use multiple fields of science and pull them together and try to get a consistent picture of what's going on. Yeah. With regards to the sea water extraction and that, um, <clears throat> just speculating, if you had um, self-reproducing self machines, like von Neumann probes, 
then um, having a probe go down into an ocean is a very reasonable thing to do because it might be able to self-replicate in the ocean by pulling out materials. You wouldn't have to undergo some mining and you know build a whole <laughs> a whole mine and dig things, dig up minerals and supplies. Um, but you might be able to extract this all from seawater, and that would be valuable because it's um, oceans are expected to be common on planets. Yeah, uh, again, to, to just this, this connection to other technologies and bridging the gap. AI is another gap that seems like it's being bridged there. Um, and I'm starting to see more and more talk, I guess, about uh, how AI is becoming a form of non-human intelligence, right? And so in the UAP community, people are starting to reference that. Now, like, I, I know a number of people that are using ChatGPT and AI tools to do research, and so that is useful, but people are all also starting to say, okay, if we have AI as an example, what could that potentially tell us about non-human intelligence? Yeah, I mean, well, as an, as an example, it could tell you, uh, it's, it's hard to say what it could tell you. I mean, we, yeah, we don't no, really know a, yet, a, right? We don't one. really we're, know we're, where AI is going. And, um, and well, I think what we'll probably learn most is how we interact with it. We'll probably learn more about ourselves um, from that yeah, and how we'll interact point. with it. And so how we interact with AI would be is will be one of our first examples of how we'll interact with non-human intelligence. Yeah, well, and, and hopefully so, some, of the, some of the news reports I've read have showed that, um, not surprisingly, you know, it, it varies, right, but some humans don't treat AI as well as they probably could, and so, you know, maybe this is another reason why UAP are, are perhaps a little bit skittish, I guess. <laughs> that possibly. Yeah. Well, so it, again, going back to this conference, what are some of the things, what are some of the highlights, I guess, that, that you've been most excited about? I'm probably most excited about the number of people who are involved and the level of involvement. Um, this conference has grown from being a rather small group of people to a rather large conference of very active people, multiple groups attacking the problems from many different directions and, and I'm, I'm so I'm very excited about that that's interesting yeah well and that's that's actually that's an excellent point I, I think a lot of UFO culture has been exactly that it's been culture and so a lot of UFO fairs and a lot of UFO conferences have been like this cultural reinforcement of shared stories right and that's not necessarily bad but it's also not science that moves things forward right so yeah, and that's not what we're seeing here. We're seeing many different groups coming in and, and looking at the problem from different perspectives. So you've got us at UAPX, or, you know, I've gone out and set up equipment and tried to record imagery. And, you know, and meanwhile, um, Beatrix Villa Royale, for example, in Sweden with her Vasco project is, is looking out of our old photographic plates. A uh, totally different methodology and she has the capability of discovering things that are going to be very different from what we would discover. So yeah. that's, that's very interesting. Well, and data analysis also. That was something that I saw yesterday. And I, offhand, I can't remember who the speakers were. But what impressed me was they were able to take um, the New Fork database. And they're, they're not the first people who have done this. But they did another analysis of that and I think other data sources as well. And so they're <laughs> mining that for information, which is really exciting. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah. Well, so in terms of moving forward, um, again, I, I believe there was the UAP historical intent analysis. I'm probably getting that wrong, but that came out earlier this year. Uh, Larry had talked about that. I know there are new papers. Uh, can you tell me what you're working on currently that we can expect to see in the future? What I'm working on currently, let's see, yes. Um, well, we are working on getting our summary paper for our first UAPX mission um, published. Right now, that, that paper is under revision. Um, part of that includes writing another paper on which basically summarizes the history of um, the science of the study of 
of UAP. Going through the past history and also current, the present um, efforts. Ah, okay. And so that's, there's a number of us working on writing this paper now, which is, which is interesting. And, and we hope to do that to basically inform new groups of, of what, what has been done, what works well, you know, and what, you know, recommendations different groups have made. And then as people come into this discipline, it helps bring them up to speed as well. Right, exactly. Yeah. Well, Kevin, I think that was everything that I had. I don't know, do you have anything that you want to speak on or? Hmm. No, I think that's it. Okay. Yeah. Well, again, it's been truly a pleasure and truly an honor having you with me. And it's mm -hmm. absolutely wonderful to speak with you in person, finally. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah, exciting. thank you for having me. Absolutely.